Hello and welcome to Stock Issues of Policy Advocacy Part 1 Overview. This is the first in a six-part series of recorded lectures that help to illustrate what stock issues are and the role that they play in policy advocacy. Again, we are on uh, presentation number one, which is the overview. This will be followed by five other presentations dealing with ill, blame, cure, and cost-benefit, the four various stock issues, and finally, the way that we use stock issues to organize a speech. Two main topics that will be covered in this presentation are the burdens of proof and then an overview of what stock issues are and a short introduction into the four stock issues. So let's begin by looking at burden of proof. Burden of proof is the idea that there are some people that when they make claims need to then prove their claims. And typically that's the case. Whoever's making a claim needs to prove it. But when we have an argument or when we have a dispute or when we're debating public policy, one side typically has the burden of proof and the other doesn't. And it's critically important to understand who has the burden of proof and what, as an advocate, you need to do to meet your burden of proof. So here's a fun little comic. The top panels, the guy in the yellow says, sometimes I turn into a unicorn. And the guy in the green says, oh yeah, prove it. Guy in the yellow turns into a unicorn. And the guy in the green says, okay, you're right. And that is typically the case. Whoever is making the claim then has the burden of proof to prove their claim correct. Bottom panel illustrates what happens when we shift the burden of proof. Sometimes I turn into a unicorn. Oh yeah, prove it. You can't prove that I don't. And the guy in the green is just left there dumbfounded because it is not the guy in the green's job to prove that he can't turn into a unicorn. Whoever is making the claim has to prove the claim. That is the way that burden of proof works. Let's look at it in another way. Uh, as we look at the burden of proof in a legal setting, here you, we uh, can see three different scales of justice with the plaintiff in the red on one side and the defendive, defendant in the green on the other. When we look at the idea of the defendant winning on the far right, when the defendant's evidence outweighs the plaintiff evidence, the defendant clearly wins. Whoever has the best and most convincing evidence gets to win, so that makes sense. On the bottom, the plaintiff wins. When the plaintiff's evidence outweighs the defendant's evidence. So if the plaintiff has more and better and more convincing evidence, then the plaintiff gets to win. But notice in that upper left, if it's a tie, if we really can't tell from the evidence who has the most, the defendant wins by default. The tie goes to the defendant. Because if the plaintiff doesn't have enough evidence to support his case, then the defendant wins. The plaintiff has the burden of proof. Now, plaintiff and defendant are the kinds of uh, language that we use in a civil trial. In a criminal trial, I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase, innocent until proven guilty. The criminal in a criminal case does not need to prove his or her innocence. There is no burden of proof to prove that they are innocent. It is the job of the prosecution to prove that they are guilty. And if the jury looks at it and says, hey, we don't have enough proof, well, the defendant goes free, innocent until proven guilty. Let me tell you another story about this. Uh, you might recognize this picture as being taken from a polygamist raid that happened in, the, uh, in Texas. Oh, about five, maybe ten years ago. The concern was that there were reports of abuse in this uh, polygamous compound, the Yearning for Zion Ranch in Texas. So the Texas authorities came in, rounded up all of the kids, and basically told the parents, 
until you can prove that you are fit parents, your children will remain in foster care. Now there are two problems here. The first problem is how do you prove that you're a fit parent if you don't have any children to be a parent to? So that's challenging. The other problem is that we had a significant shift in the burden of proof. It is not up to the parents to prove that they are fit parents. It is up to the state to prove that they are unfit parents before the children can be removed. And notice that there are four potential conditions going on. One condition is the kids aren't being abused and they get to stay with their parents. And I think we could all agree that that's probably a good thing. Another situation is that children are being abused and they are taken out of their abusive homes. And I think that most of us could agree that that's a potentially good thing. But notice two other potential conditions. The potential condition where the children are not being abused, everything is fine, the parents are good parents, and the state forcibly removes a child from that situation. I think we would all agree that that's a bad thing. Or that there is abuse going on in the home and that the children are abused and neglected and whatever other horrible things we want to uh, consider there and they are left in the home. And we would also consider that that's a bad thing. But notice the choice that we have to make as a society. Which bad thing would we rather live with? Parent, or children in a good situation being forcibly removed from their homes, or children in a bad situation remaining there because of the lack of convincing evidence. At some point, our justice system has said, innocent until proven guilty, we will allow the, child, the children to remain until there is enough evidence. I go through all of these stories to reinforce the fact that the advocate of change must justify the change. It is your job as the policy advocate to justify the change. Again, let me give you another out there example that illustrates it. Someone could advocate for a change in current policy and say, we should legalize marijuana. And someone else say, well, prove to me that that's a good idea. And they come back and say, hey, prove to me that it isn't. Until you can prove that marijuana should be illegal, we ought to just legalize it. Well, that was a shifting of the burden of proof. The advocate of change must justify the change. Consistent with that is the language that the status quo has presumption. Status quo is Latin for the current state of things. Presumption means we'll assume that's okay. And so status quo has presumption is that the current policies that are in place are innocent until proven guilty. So how does a policy advocate prove that a change needs to take place? Change is justified through the stock issues. So if we understand what the stock issues are, and if we go through the stock issues in a policy advocacy speech, then the policy advocate has met their burden. So we need to define what a stock issue is. And when we use the term stock in stock issues, it's the same way we use the term stock in stock characters. Let me give you a quick illustration of that. So let's pretend that we are planning the next James Bond movie, that we're, we're writing the screenplay. First question we need to ask is, what characters do we need? So stop and think about that for a second. Again, we don't know what the plot is. We don't know what the setting is. We haven't even cast any actors yet. But what are the characters that we need to write into our James Bond screenplay? Well, the first character we probably need is James Bond. And so we'll cast, we'll write James Bond into the script. Well, who else do we need? We need a Bond girl. At least one Bond girl. Two or three might make the film all that more exciting. So we put in multiple Bond girls. One of them's probably going to end up being evil. That's just the way the Bond girls work. In the end, he might need to save the Bond girl 
from the evil villain. And so we have our wide variety of villains that will show up in our James Bond movie. Villain will be aided in their evil plans by some sort of a henchman, who might also provide comic belief, re, comic relief. And uh, though not characters per se, we might also have some vehicles and gadgets and other things that are an important part of our James Bond movie. Notice we have no idea what James Bond is going to be doing yet. Okay, we know that he'll eventually save the world, but we don't know how, we don't know what he's going to save the world from, but we know our characters. Even outside of the James Bond universe, do we see these same characters, that we have a hero, a damsel in distress, a villain, sidekicks. All of these are stock characters in storytelling, at least James Bond storytelling. In the same way, the stock issues are questions that people would have about a policy. Uh, a fun thing I sometimes do in class is tell people I'm holding a press conference about this new policy and tell everyone that before I announce the policy, I'm going to ask if there are any questions and see what questions people can generate without knowing the details or the topic area of the policy. And we can usually do a pretty good job. So think about that for yourself. What are some questions that you might ask no matter what the intended policy is? Well, this is more of an action speech than a policy speech, but kind of illustrates it. We must take action. Do we have to? Why is this urgent? Well, what should we do? It seems hard. Can we really do it? We have no idea what the proposed action even is but notice all of the intelligent questions we can start to ask. Here's another laundry list of intelligent questions that we could always ask. Why are we doing this? What problem are we solving? Is this actually useful? Are we adding value? Will this change behavior? Is there an easier way? What's the opportunity cost? Is it really worth it? I have no idea what we're talking about, but I can always ask these questions. In the same way, even though I don't know what the story is, I know what the stock characters are likely to be, even if I don't know what the issue or the policy is, I have a pretty good idea of what the various stock issues might be. So how do we define stock issues? Well, one working definition is that these are answers to questions reasonable people would have about any new policy. Doesn't matter what the policy is, there are questions that reasonable people can ask. And the role of the policy advocate is to anticipate and answer these questions for their audience. You can probably think of a time that you've been in a presentation and you have a number of questions and you're like, I really wish my questions would have been answered and because they weren't, you're frustrated. Probably other times when you find yourself, you know, kind of asking questions yourself during a presentation and you hear the presenter answer these questions. Think about how reassuring that is, about how that increases the speaker's ethos. That's the same thing you want to do. So what are the stock issues? Well, the first is the stock issue of ill. That is I-L-L, -L, not Roman numeral three. Ill. What's the problem? What's the nature of the problem? Who's suffering? Why are, how are they suffering? The second is the issue of blame. Why does the problem persist? We typically need to analyze the problem before we can go about solving it. And that's the stock issue of blame. The next stock issue is cure. How can we solve the problem? What policy are you going to introduce that has as its likely effect our ability to solve this problem? And finally, cost-benefit. Is the solution a good deal? All solutions are going to come with advantages. All solutions will come with disadvantages. The role of the policy advocate is to lay those out and explain those for their audience. So we've just completed the overview, the first in the six-part series. Uh, look at the other videos to learn more about ill, blame, cure, cost-benefit, and organization.